Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We come to a very important chapter. 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1 is where we're going to pick it up today. And we're entering the, the latter part of David's reign, the, the late years of his reign. And David's beginning to make poor decisions. Um, in our last lesson, we talked uh, at length about the uh, adulterous affair he had with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and the, the consequences of that, David uh, pretty much convicted of murder of Uriah by our Heavenly Father. And we're going to see another bad decision today. Now, am I coming down on David too hard? I don't think so. Uh, David was a good king for the most part. One thing he certainly never did was fall away from our Heavenly Father. Now, it's not to say that he wasn't a man, and you know, none of us are perfect. We all fall short. Uh, David certainly uh, didn't uh, uh, disqualify himself from that. He was a man, and uh, he made mistakes. He's about to make another big mistake. I think, you know, when someone is the king of the most powerful nation in, in the world at this time, uh, speaking of David being king of Israel, the power goes to their head after a period of time. They, pride uh, comes into it. And that's, I think, the, the main reason that David made the mistake that he's about to make. And so without any further uh, uh, delay, let's get into our lesson today. We're asked that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, and it reads, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it states that the Lord moved David to number Israel. I think more accurately, Satan is the one that did it. Uh, what we're going to see, and those of you who don't know what we're talking about, to number Israel isn't like taking a census uh, today. You don't count every head. Uh, and, and what you count are the fighting men, those who are able to draw a sword and uh, enter into battle. That's what was numbered. And God uh, ordered the first several numberings of Israel. And but he did not order this one, and that's what is going to uh, where David makes a mistake. Uh, this word provoked in the Hebrew is soothe. It can mean by implication to seduce. Uh, and I couldn't help but think about 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the teachings of Paul, where uh, the devil, uh, Satan, seduced, he beguiled is the way it's translated there. But that's a Greek word, expateo which means he wholly seduced Eve. Well, he just seduced David as well. It states in James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 that God isn't able to tempt man, but every man is drawn away by his own lusts. And that's the reason I think that, that, that it's more accurate that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David uh, rather than the Lord. The Lord does not tempt man. Man finds ways to tempt himself uh, through his lusts. Verse 2, And David said to Joab, that's his nephew and commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel, and to the rulers of the people, the tribe princes, in other words, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it from Beersheba to Dan. Beersheba, if you're not familiar with the geography of Israel, was in the extreme south. Dan in the extreme north. So in other words, he's instructing Joab and the tribe princes 
to number everyone uh, from the extreme uh, more, most south to the extreme most north. This is pride uh, leading David to do this. You know, back when David had a ragtag army of 200 to 400 men and they were taking on the armies of Saul, thousands of, of armies, uh, men of Israel. And God delivered David and his ragtag army over and over again. David depended on God. Now David is numbering the troops so he can see how many men do I have under me? How powerful am I? He's depending on the number of soldiers below him rather than depending on God above him. Verse 3, And Joab answered the Lord, Make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. May God multiply the armies of Israel a hundredfold if that would be pleasing to the king. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Question. Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Trespass is sin. And Joab is saying, you know, David, why are you, are you bringing this guilt upon the nation of Israel? You, you know that every man in your armies would die for you. That's what this uh, not my Lord's servants means. They, they loved David. They trusted David. They knew David was always in for, uh, out for their best welfare. And uh, now he's causing this. Joab thinks David is wrong. And yes, Joab is the nephew of David. And that might allow him to think he could speak more frankly than someone who wasn't a member of David's family. But we see in this that Joab certainly wasn't a yes man. He wouldn't say yes, David, uh, no matter what David said, he'd say yes just to be agreeing with the king. He wasn't afraid to disagree with David. He's saying, are you sure you want to do this? Verse 4. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. It was stronger in the Hebrew. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Well, Joab didn't get in a hurry about counting all the troops. And the fact is, he didn't even count all the troops. Uh, it's written in a, in, uh, that he did not count Levi or Benjamin, and as we'll see in a, f a future verse, I think verse 6, verse 5. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand. A thousand thousand is a million plus a hundred thousand is one million one hundred thousand. And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. And I think this, and, and this, this count took nine months and twenty days, we find when we get to chapter 27, verse 24. And it's also stated there that this count was not entered into the annals, the records, in other words. Why? Well, it wasn't a complete count, number one. He did not count Levi and Benjamin, and I think it was pretty much a haphazard count. You can bet Joab was not uh, going about this census or the numbering of the armies of Israel uh, with a great deal of zeal. He thought it was the wrong thing to do, and so did the Lord. Verse 6, But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Joab was counting, but he wasn't counting in a hurry. And David would realize his sin uh, after a period of time. In fact, is it's written in chapter 27, verse 24, that David ordered that the count cease <clears throat> when he realized that it was a transgression against the Lord. Verse 7. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel, and he struck Israel. In the Hebrew, this reads, it was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And 
Why was it evil? Because David's pride was the motive for this numbering. He wanted to know how many men he had under him, meaning how powerful am I? Well, it was David that messed up. Why did God smite uh, all of Israel? Well, more on that in a moment. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the with the, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. David realizes he has made a mistake. And the mistake David made, I think, the root of it, was he allowed Satan to get into his head. Uh, pride is Satan's downfall. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, where Satan is called the king of Tyre, uh, he was promoted to a very high rank, the cherub that protects the mercy seat. He got all puffed up in himself, though, and pride took over, and <clears throat> he didn't want to protect the mercy seat. He wanted to sit in the mercy seat. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but again, David allowed Satan to get in his head, and when you uh, start having someone puff you up, and tell you how great you are, be careful because that's Satan's favorite tool to use is pride. And all the while he's building you up and telling you how great you are, uh, he'll pull the rug out from under you so fast that it will make your head spin. <clears throat> Verse 9, And the Lord spake unto Gad, <clears throat> David's seer, <coughs> excuse me, saying, and Gad is a prophet, a seer. Uh, people sometimes when they read that, they get uh, envision a uh, wizard sitting down with a crystal ball or someone uh, reading the clouds trying to determine future events. So, but Gad is actually a prophet of God. The Hebrew word is kose, and it means, uh, it even tells us the means that the revelation is given to him. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Kose, if you translate it, means a beholder in a vision. Here's what God had to say about David numbering the troops of Israel. Verse 10, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. David is about to be faced with a difficult decision. In fact, it is, it's such a difficult decision that David won't make the decision. He'll uh, yield to the Lord to make up his mind which was the most fitting. <clears throat> Willingness to accept the punishment is a big part of gaining forgiveness. Uh, people have a tendency to blame others. And at this point, David realizes he doesn't have anybody to blame but himself. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, choose thee. The choice is yours, David. <clears throat> Verse 12, either three years of famine. Now, David was very concerned about his people. He, he was a type for the good shepherd, part of a shepherd's responsibility is making sure that his people are fed, his sheep are fed. And a famine of three years would be very, very painful for his people, his subjects. Or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee. Uh, three years of famine or three months of running for your life with your enemies nipping at your heels the whole way. I can assure you David was not uh, one to run from a fight, and the idea of being on the run from his enemy for three months would not be uh, David's style at all. Or else, the third choice, three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence. This would be in the form of a plague 
like the ten plagues that God brought against Egypt in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coast, the borders of Israel. Now therefore advise or decide thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And of course the him that sent Gad the prophet uh, was Yahweh. Now th three years of famine, three months of running for your life from the enemy, or three days with the angel of the Lord and uh, bringing death among his subjects. And you talk about having to name your own, pick your own poison, uh, that's the situation that David is presented here. Any of these three choices, the three years of famine, the three months of being on the run from an enemy, or three days with the plague of the Lord upon Israel would take a care of the root of this problem. Uh, this problem was caused by David wanting to know how many men he had in his army, the census, the count, the numbering of his people. And this would greatly, any of the three of his choices are going to reduce uh, the, the cause of his pride, knowing the number of his people. And David said unto Gad, <clears throat> I am in a great strait, severely distressed. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great or very many are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Just don't let me fall into the hand of mine enemies. And David's probably making as wise a choice as he can after making a poor choice of deciding to number the troops of Israel when God didn't ask him to or instruct him to. Uh, he's leaving it up to God to make the decision. He's, he's saying God's merciful and whatever God decides is going to be fair. In fact, is it's been my experience that the punishment will be less than I am actually deserving of. Verse 14, so the Lord sent pestilence, a plague, upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Now, it's hard for some folks to figure and, and, and decide why did God strike 70,000 of Israel when David was the one that made this poor decision. Well, you see, things were not going all that well in Israel at this time. The, there was a lot of sin going on among the people. You had the uh, situation of Absalom's rebellion. Absalom, one of David's sons, uh, tried to usurp the throne from his father, a throne that was ordained of God. That's a sin to, to try and remove one of God's anointed from office. But Absalom did it. Uh, he went so far as to sit in the gate of Jerusalem and when a stranger or someone coming in would come to the city, he'd say, you there, who are you and what's your cause? And, well, I'm Bob and I'm from Hebron and somebody stole one of my calves and I'm here to get justice from the king. And Absalom would say, oh, it's just too bad that I'm not the king because you're in the right. And if I were the king, you would certainly receive justice. David ran for his life uh, rather than have the civil war and cause the streets of Jerusalem to run with blood. Um, Absalom uh, would go into David's concubines while he was gone, uh, uh, accomplishing one of the three things of the punishments that David received for the adulterous affair with Bathsheba. You also had another who led an insurrection. His name was Sheba, also tried to take the throne of God. But uh, the, again, <clears throat> any of these three would have caused the census to go down considerably. 70,000, you can be sure, a lot of those were those who were numbered among Israel. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil. Better probably, he pitied the hurt that was uh, being administered. 
and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. Stop the plague. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now, this Ornan is called uh, Araunna in 2 Samuel chapter 24, uh, verse 18. The Septuagint states that this plague lasted only until noon on the first day. Now, if 70,000 died uh, in a half a day, it's a good thing that this plague didn't go on for three days as originally planned, or there would have been a lot more people killed. But God repented himself and, and stopped the angel of the Lord. Verse 16, And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. Can you imagine what an awesome sight seeing the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a sword drawn over your city, Jerusalem? Um, there was a lot of repenting going on. Wearing a sackcloth is a sign of mourning. And you can bet David was praying and the people uh, of Jerusalem were praying right along with David that this action would stop. I couldn't help but think about uh, Balaam, uh, who uh, was attempted to curse uh, Israel at the beckoning of the king of Moab. In fact, it was bribery of the king of Moab. And uh, what happened? Well, uh, Balaam was going to uh, do what the king of Moab wanted to do and he was on the way and the angel of the Lord stood in his path with sword drawn and uh, Balaam didn't see uh, the angel of the Lord, the donkey did. That was when the donkey spoke and, and told Balaam what the, how the, the bread was buttered, verse 17. And David said unto God, is it not that not I that commanded the people to be numbered. Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. This word in, uh, evil is ra'ah. It means I've injured or, or caused hurt. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Question. Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people that they should be plagued. David, a type for the good shepherd, uh, the shepherd who protects his sheep at all costs. David was a good king. He cared about his people. He loved his people. This was true repentance too on David's part, accepting the blame. He wasn't trying to lay the blame on someone else uh, for his uh, poor decision in numbering the troops of Israel. He's taking the blame squarely on his own shoulders. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now the purpose, of course, in setting up an altar would be to offer uh, sacrifices to the Lord. And note, God selected where this altar was to be made. Uh, it was the threshing floor of Ornan. This would uh, is a place that many of you are familiar with from if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 22 verse 2. It's called Moriah. It's where uh, Abraham was instructed to sacrifice his only son Isaac and he was, had the faith that he was going to go ahead with it. But uh, God, of course, provided a ram uh, in, in place of Isaac, uh, Abraham's son. It's also the place where the temple of Solomon would eventually be built. <clears throat> Verse 19, And David went up at the saying of Gad, 
and which he spake in the name of the Lord according to, I think David being very careful to follow God's instructions uh, to the letter, to obey God, I sure would. Verse 20, And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, the angel of the Lord, with sword drawn, which he spake uh, in the name of the Lord. And I sent, oh, I'm sorry, I missed up there. Uh, Ornan turned back, we got to verse 20, and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And uh, this, again, would be an awesome sight to see the angel of the Lord with sword drawn. And they're, they're, they're afraid, they're, they're hiding themselves, but they're probably peeking out, watching to see what's going to happen next. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Obviously, Ornan recognized David and knew who he was to pay uh, such homage to him. And he's just seen, uh, Ornan and his sons have just seen the angel of the Lord with the sword drawn. Now the king of Israel comes in his presence. Uh, he's probably wondering, what next? Then David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor. This word grant in the Hebrew is give me. Uh, and uh, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it to me for the full price. He said he didn't mean give it to me literally. He says I'll pay you. That the plague may be stayed uh, from the people. Sell the threshing floor to me that the plague may be stopped. This word place uh, is in the Hebrew is makom. And it's used here as in Ruth chapter 4, verse 10, and it's referring to the whole place. And the reason I say that is, is that explains uh, an apparent uh, discrepancy in God's Word, uh, which we'll cover here in the next few verses. There are no discrepancies in God's Word. It's our inability to understand. Verse 23, And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for a meat offering, I give it all. This meat offering in the Hebrew is minka. It's usually a bloodless uh, offering to the Lord, often uh, wheat or uh, some type of grain. Ornan was certainly a very uh, generous fellow. Um, and of course, uh, to be accepted for a sacrifice, though, uh, David knew that he could not offer Ornan's possessions. He had to offer his own possessions, and he's going to uh, insist that Ornan sell. Now, what these instruments of wood would be the threshing sledges uh, which were made of timber, part of the apparatus that uh, beats the uh, grain loose from the chaff. Verse 24, And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost, without cost to myself. And again, it's necessary that when you offer to the Lord at this time, when the offerings were acceptable, God, of course, doesn't want your animal sacrifices anymore. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, God says, I want your mercy, which could be translated, I want your love rather than your burnt offerings. So uh, young people don't think that you would be pleasing to God to offer an animal sacrifice. But at this time, David's absolutely correct. You had to have possession of the gift. Uh, that became a problem at the time of Jesus. Uh, people would uh, be going to the temple and they'd stop in and buy some mite infested dove to offer as a sacrifice to the Lord. 
and that was actually unacceptable to the Lord. What you offer had to be of your own and should have been the very best that you have. In other words, the most perfect uh, goat or sheep that you had, one that did not have uh, any um, defects. Verse 26, uh, I should say, let's see, uh, 25. So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. Now, here's where some people think there's a discrepancy in the word because in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, it states that David paid Ornan 50 shekels. But the explanation is in that word that we uh, talked about in verse 22, the place, Makom, referring to the whole place. So what we had there were two transactions. Uh, David paid 50 shekels uh, for the threshing floor alone, but the area that would have been required for the tabernacle, uh, which would had the inner court, the outer court, would have required more than just a threshing floor. So uh, Ornan owned more land that David purchased now in verses 26 through 30, uh, we have things here that are specific to Chronicles. That you won't find them in this, this event in Samuel or the Kings. Um, this reminded me of the Greek name for Chronicles, Paralipomena, which means things omitted. So. These things were omitted from Samuel and Kings. Let's go with verse 26. And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. All sacrifices accepted by God were consumed by fire from heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. So the Lord was pleased with David's reactions by indicated by stopping the plague. Now he's accepted David's offerings on the altar that he instructed David to uh, make, build on the uh, threshing floor of Ornan, Mount Moriah. Well, we'll come back and see how this turns out in our next lecture. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad, being very specific in your freedom of Christianity. The repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please uh, don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we attempt to teach God's Word in a positive manner and putting out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. And, and if you're listening by shortwave radio or studying by, via the internet somewhere around the world that you're unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. Make time each day to, 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 to talk with your Father. 
and you can. You can talk to him like he's your flesh father. He is that close to you or will be if you will be that close to him. And that's important to always remember that your relationship with your heavenly father doesn't depend on him. It depends on you. He's the same yesterday, today, and will be tomorrow. Uh, your relationship depends on you. So uh, he loves you. He may or may not love what you're doing, but talk to your heavenly father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. You know the needs of these, Father, uh, financial difficulties, uh, addiction to drugs, alcohol. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks across the country. First up today, we have Bob in Indiana. <clears throat> and thank you for your kind comments. Uh, Melchizedek, <clears throat> is this Jesus? This is Jesus, isn't it? Question. Yes, you're correct. Uh, Melchizedek, if you uh, analyze what the, the, the etymology of the word is, Melka in the Hebrew language is king. Uh, Zedek are the elect, and Jesus is the king of the Zadok, if you will, the elect, another form of the word. <clears throat> Make a note of Hebrews uh, chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 3, and you read there about it, and you'll, it's very easy to conclude that Melchizedek is Jesus. Uh, also in the latter uh, verses of John chapter 8, um, they, Jesus tells the, the folks that are there, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they said, you're not even 50 years old yet. And you say, before Abraham was, you are? And what he meant by that, he received tithes of Abraham. Why? That because you remember back in Genesis, Melchizedek, receive tithes of Abraham, and that's what Jesus meant there. You follow with question two. Uh, when God in Genesis came to visit Adam in the cool of the day, was this Jesus? Well, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 states that a, a, a virgin will conceive and have a son, and you'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. John chapter 1, verse 1 in the New Testament. In the beginning was the Word. That's logos in the Greek language. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Joni from Arizona, I have a question. Well, two. I heard Dennis talk about tattoos uh, while writing this, I guess. I have a friend that I know she loves Christ. She says that people who have passed away come and bother her and they're asking her to help them tell a loved one something. Can you help me with this? I don't know what to tell her. She wishes they would leave her alone, but they won't. Well, let's talk about the tattoos first. In God's Word in the book of Leviticus, it says, Thou shalt put no marks on you as the heathen do to mourn the dead is what the subject is, uh, or cuttings in their flesh. So I'll let you make up your own mind. Anything that you do in the flesh, though, is not uh, uh, such as eating unclean animals. That's not a sin against your soul. It's a sin against your flesh. Now, your friend, that's a more serious matter. Uh, that's, I believe, she's probably possessed by a familiar spirit, such as the witch of Endor was possessed with uh, in the book of First Samuel. Um, I, I think in my advice to you would be to get her to someone, or if you're capable, uh, you want to be careful of what you're doing, but you have power over all of our enemies in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, someone needs to anoint this young lady. I assume it's a lady. You didn't say whether it was male or female. Yeah, you said she, but uh, female friend 
but someone needs to anoint her with the oil of our people and order all negative and evil away from her in the name of Jesus Christ. She then needs to fill her house, her body, with Jesus Christ because as it's written in the book of Matthew that if you uh, expel a, an evil spirit and they come back and they found the house, the body, clean and swept empty, uh, they get seven more of their friends and move in and the person's in worse shape than they were before you expelled the one spirit. So uh, when you have Jesus Christ in you and the Holy Spirit in you, the evil spirits want nothing to do with you. Patricia in Georgia, could you please ask Pastor Murray what does elect lady mean in the Bible? Elect lady appears only one time in the King James Version Bible. <clears throat> you find it in the second epistle of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and it, it refers to Mother Israel. Nana in Maryland. Good morning, Dennis and staff. Good afternoon, it is here. Where in God's Word does it speak about spilling seed? And does it say God would rather you place the seed in a belly of a harlot than to spill it on the ground. That latter part is not biblical. That's, you won't find that anywhere in the Bible. Now, you will find in Genesis chapter 38, verse 9, uh, Onan was one of the sons of Judah, and his brother uh, passed away before he had raised up seed to his brother's wife. In other words, they had not had children. And it was law at that time that a man would bring seed up to his brother. Uh, Onan spilled his seed on the ground, though in preference or rather than raising seed up to his brother's wife. Uh, that's the only thing I could think of about seed on the ground in God's Word. Martha in Georgia, Pastor Dennis, in Proverbs 31.15, it talks about a virtuous woman. Uh, she gives meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Does that mean she rises early and prays for everyone? No, I understand that to mean uh, that she feeds her family. And uh, I guess you could take that to a spiritual level and that she is also concerned about them being spiritually fed. Second question, was the act committed with the devil and Eve an act of adultery? No, in Genesis uh, 2, verses 16, 17, God told Adam and Eve, you may eat of any of the trees of the garden freely, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for uh, in that, if, when you do eat of that, in the day you do, you will die. Uh, that was the first commandment given by God, and that's the commandment that Eve uh, and Adam eventually broke. The law of adultery not given, of course, until the time of Moses, which was centuries after Adam and Eve. <clears throat> Willene from Texas, we love you as well. Um, do you all think we will be able to hug our loved ones uh, that have passed away. And yes, I certainly do. Uh, God uh, has a very special place in his heart for family. Uh, Esau and Jacob come to mind. Esau uh, didn't think much of his uh, family. He, he sold his birthright for a, pole, a bowl of red pottage. So uh, God uh, loves people who are family oriented. He loves family. You are going to know your relatives uh, when we go into spiritual bodies. That's easily documented in Ezekiel chapter 44 verses 25 and 26. To go to one of your immediate family members, you would certainly have to be able to recognize them. Cecilia from California, I would like to know if tithing on an is tithing on inheritance the same as on income? I do want to do things right. Yes, I would say uh, inheritance is income. Uh, you should tithe on. Uh, pray about it, though, and uh, 
uh, take God's lead. Do, do what you said, do what's right. That's, that's the good thing to do. Kenny in Kentucky, would an organ donor be considered a righteous act? Yes, I, I believe so. And what, what a gift. Uh, you might uh, give, you know, and you're certainly not going to need any of your flesh body at any time after you pass away. Uh, the flesh returns to the dust and the spirit returns to the Father from whence it came. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, what a gift if someone uh, was about to die and needed a heart or a liver transplant and you didn't need that heart or liver anymore, what better gift could you give? Or, or someone who is losing their eyesight and, and your donation uh, would give them sight for the rest of their life. Yeah, I would consider those a righteous act. Teresa in Texas, if you knew God wanted you to do something specific, but you didn't do it, can you be forgiven? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, after God forgives, you don't forget to forgive yourself, though, and that's a big problem with Christians. We, we like to beat ourselves up over and over and over when God has completely blotted out the sin. So uh, I don't know what it was you said that you would do, uh, but what, it's not possible at this point in time that anyone has committed the unforgivable sin. Terry in Virginia, is there a serenity prayer in the Bible? If so, where is it? Uh, the serenity prayer is not biblical. There is a popular serenity prayer written by uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, and he was alive from the year 1892 to 1971. It goes something along the lines, Lord, give me the serenity to, uh, uh, I, I don't even know the prayer, but it's not biblical, but that, that's what it is. Mark in New York, Proverbs 120, does this have to do with two witnesses in Revelation? No, I don't, I don't see that at all. Proverbs uh, verse one, uh, chapter one, verse 20, it states, wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. And it's wisdom talking there, do you answer when wisdom cries out to you is the question. Nothing to do with two witnesses. Alicia in Alabama, what's the difference between the 7,000 elect and the 144,000? Please explain. Uh, the 7,000 <clears> are the very elect. They're the ones, uh, such as in 1 Kings, that God said, I've reserved 7,000 who will not bow a knee to Baal. <clears throat> there are 7,000 on earth now that will not worship or bow a knee to the Antichrist. Um, the 144,000, uh, there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, when they see the 7,000 uh, witnessing against the Antichrist, they're going to go, oh, I knew that, and they're going to join the 7,000 in not worshiping the Antichrist. You follow, God says he puts a dome over the earth. <coughs> Excuse me, where is that? <clears throat> I believe you're thinking about the cube that John measured in Revelation uh, chapter 21, verse 16. I think that's what you're talking about. John in Georgia, is Christianity in the Bible? <clears throat> if so, where? Of course Christianity is in the Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, uh, Jesus said, Thou art to Peter, and upon this rock, Petra is Peter's name, I will build my church. Uh, what kind of church do you think Christ would build? A Christian church, of course. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches that Jesus talks about there, uh, they are all Christian churches. And, you know, churches today, it doesn't matter what 
uh, shingle you hang on the door, in other words, what name you call your church, what denomination you call your church, you want to make sure your church is like two of those seven churches, Smyrna in Revelation 2, Philadelphia in Revelation 3. And what was it that Jesus found no fault with about those churches? They knew who those who claimed to be our brother Judah, but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. That's the Kenites. You, you want to possess that key of David, which is mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, that key that opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. <clears throat> Duncan in North Carolina, why do we celebrate Christmas when Jesus or none of the prophets told us to? Well, I like to celebrate Christmas because it was the day that Jesus Christ was conceived and the Word became flesh. That, uh, my friend, is something to celebrate indeed. George in Tennessee, what does begotten mean? Okay, the Hebrew word in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, one of the places it appears, is yalad, and it means to bear young. Uh, the Greek word in John uh, 3.16, probably the most memorized verse in the Bible in the Greek, is monogenes, and it means only born, and Jesus was the only born of God, the only begotten Son of God. <clears throat> Alfred in Texas, how do I get info on the ten tribes? Well, we offer a book uh, through our library about the uh, ten tribes of Israel, the northern tribes that went into captivity to the Assyrian. Uh, it's book number 14.01. It's called Missing Links Discovered in the Assyrian Tablets. Uh, it's a $15 donation. Uh, very good work on the ten northern tribes and where they went after they left the Assyrian captivity. Uh, you follow, during the age of the dinosaurs, were we flesh or spiritual bodies? There were no flesh humans on earth in the age, uh, the first earth age, when there were flesh dinosaurs on earth. How can I find out about the three earth ages? Order CD set three, or CD 30506 Three Worlds. That's one CD. Uh, uh, 30506. Nathan in Tennessee, have I sinned so much that I can't be forgiven? Absolutely not. Uh, no one has sinned so much that they cannot be forgiven at this time. Uh, the, the unforgivable sin, which is you can read about in uh, in chapter uh, 12 of Luke, verses 10 through 13, and that's good, thank you. Uh, but anyway, it's not uh, possible that you have sinned so much that you can't be forgiven. Uh, one of the disciples would ask Jesus, if my brother sins against me, how many times should I uh, forgive him? Seven? And Jesus said, no, seven times seventy, which is 490 times. I doubt that you've sinned that much, my friend Nathan. Felicia in Illinois, does God have a connection <clears throat> to the lily flower? He sure does. It's, uh, you can find it in the greatest love story ever told. It's called the Song of Solomon, one of the books of the Bible. Um, and one place in there it says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And chapter 2, verse 2 of Song of Solomon, as a lily among thorns. And I think God's elect are as a lily among thorns. But uh, leave it at that. Edward in Ohio, what was Cain's punishment for killing his brother Abel? In Genesis uh, chapter 4, verse 11, uh, he was cursed uh, from the earth. And verse 12, the ground would not yield her fruit to him. 
uh, or his descendants. He would be a fugitive and a vagabond uh, forever, and that's even to this day. The ground will not yield her fruit to a Kenite. Don and Oklahoma, that's the reason there are no Kenite farmers, obviously. Don and Oklahoma, as regards to questions, inquiries posed about seeing and or knowing family, loved ones, in the eternal heavenly spiritual bodies, how can it truly make sense to tell people they will? Because Isaiah 65, 17 clearly states no memory uh, this current world age. And well, you know, that's talking about ages there, Don. You, you, you can't remember what happened in the first world age. Why? Because you were born into the second world age uh, without memory of what happened in the first earth age. That's what it's talking about in Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17. Rose from New York, when Jesus returns, the good, bad, and the ugly will be changed into our spiritual bodies, all of us. So who is Jesus leading into battle against? How will the blood flow as high as the horse's bridle if none of us are in the flesh? Well, you have to think spiritual, Rose, because at that time, everything will be spiritual. There will be no more flesh. And I know you're speaking of Revelation uh, chapter 14, verses 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the subject there is the wine press of the wrath of God. Uh, there's a lot of wrath to be poured out, and that's why it will run to as high as the horse's bridle. Out of time, I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And you know what? It makes your Heavenly Father's Day when he looks down and he sees you studying the letter he wrote to you, the Bible, seeking knowledge of him and trying to learn how to be pleasing to him. You please him and he's going to please you. Blessings do follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others as well. One thing most important though, and it's this, you stay in his word every day every day and your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel. P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.